good things. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome to the second of the sessions in uh, Maranga Miri 2 um, for this morning. Um, it's uh, 11.30 so we'll get straight into it uh, so we don't keep to time. Uh, so this is uh, Rachel and Alex from Greenstone and they're going to be talking about decades in colour. Morena kia ora Nick, thank you for that presentation. I'm hoping this, for those of you that were in the last session, that this will be a really lovely segue, because we're actually part of that community that is using those home movies um, to tell stories and to reach a wider audience. Um, have anyone, have many of you here seen Decades in Colour, the documentary series? Oh, a couple. I will start, in the best way we know how, with some video. From a nationwide search involving more than 700 sources comes a hidden history. So I went home and bought my first camera. We've unearthed the home movies and personal memories of families everywhere. Just ordinary people eating ordinary food. To present a brand new full colour picture of life in New Zealand. The assumption was that a woman's work was supporting the man. Filmed by the people who witnessed it and told by the Kiwis who lived it. He just, he was besotted by her. Spanning from the stoical wartime 40s to the turbulent 80s. I feel like a Kiwi. Style. We'll step through the front door of home life. I instantly felt I'd found my place. And then out into the prosperity and pitfalls of our working world. Well, it was easy to get a job. Before diving into our leisure time and the essence of how we Kiwis play. We'd go for the whole of the Christmas holidays, from Christmas right through to February. The result is a unique family history of the one family to which we all belong. There was a sense that something exceptional was happening. This is the story of New Zealand from the inside out. So hopefully that is a nice intro to explain a little bit about why a television production company is at the NDF. Um, I'm going to give you a really brief background into Greenstone. Um, we are best known for this kind of stuff. We make Motorway Patrol, Border Patrol, a lot of New Zealand's favourite primetime viewing. Um, but also one of the big changes in the last few years, and it's something that I hope that many of you in the glam sector are interested in, is the way that content has been very de-siloed. So we're no longer considered a television production company, we're content creators, we're storytellers. So the synergies with the wider sector, who we've always worked with, um, have got even closer. So Under the Bridge is a collaboration that we did with um, the New Zealand Herald, with their investigative team, and we worked with them, we created the documentary content, they created all the wraparound, it really was a multi-platform experience of journalism, photojournalism and documentary. Um, we're also currently working with this lady, or dame I should say, um, on a series called Artifact for Māori Television. We've been working with Te Papa um, and with Auckland Museum and a lot of the other museums. Uh, here we are down at Hicks Bay. Um, we make teen drama. We make interactive documentary. So this is our Young Ocean Explorers project, which is a fantastic program that's just launched, have a look, um, for five to nine-year-olds. So again, this de-siloing of content and the availability of funding to reach audiences in different ways is really interesting to us, which is why we're keen to talk to you. Um, and of course, we work with New Zealand on screen um, a lot in terms of the preservation and ongoing access to titles. It's an old doco, a beautiful one that's come back into the consciousness at the moment. But we're really here to talk about this lady, so I will hand over to Alex to start through that process. Okay. Hi there, everyone. I'm Alex Reed, and I'm the, the producer of Decades in Colour. So um, what we set out to achieve when we wrote the proposal for Decades in Colour was um, to create a, a, a collective history of New Zealand. So um, not a comprehensive history, but a collective history, um, but told from the inside out. So... Um, so what that entailed was um, looking for people who had footage that showed the way that they lived and, um, and found, finding people who had captured that on film somehow. So that was kind of our, that was our, that was our mission. 
Um, in series one, we went from the 1950s through to the 1970s, and we split the episodes up by decades. So we just sort of tried to find the, the, the essence of the 50s, the essence of the 60s, the essence of the 70s. And then when we were lucky enough to get another series, um, we decided, because we because we got a lot of footage from the 40s and in color, which we were surpri well, you know, surprised that there was the footage out there, we thought, okay, we'll go back into the 40s, and we'll also be really brave and go into the 80s where you start getting a whole lot of you know, different formats and different quality. So we thought, right, we'll go there as well because so much interesting stuff happened in New Zealand in the 80s. So we thought, let's expand it out. So that was kind of our mission when we started. So the, the brief at the beginning was to make a collective history from the inside out. And then apart from that, we didn't really know how it was going to, um, how it was going to play out because we really didn't know what we were going to get. So what we really wanted to do was to try and get the footage directly from the people um, who owned it and, and the people who had, had shot it because it was important for us to um, get the visual material but equally important always was to find the storytellers. So, um, you know, the two together was, was really essential for our process. Um, collaborating with Judy Bailey was also really important. She was a, a key connector for us. Um, and in more ways than one, really. So firstly, um, we used her when we were looking for footage. So obviously, she's very well known in New Zealand. She's the mother of the nation. Um, she's well respected. And also, she was really, really into the project. She's you know, a child of the 50s. She, um, she, she really wanted to be involved. So she was very sort of personally involved, which, which really helped. So um, she did some ads on television for us asking for footage, so a shout out, and we also did social media. Um, so she was really important, but also in the series, she was the connector. So um, because, we had, because we had footage from so many people and it was all quite rangy, we needed a linker. And so she, and particularly her voice actually, was our link from you know, personal story to collective story. So, so she was kind of um, at the heart of what, of what we did. So, um, collaborating with Judy, we, we um, asked for footage. So we just went out to the general public and we said um, we, we would like footage for the show. Um, we also went to local papers. Uh, we went to cine clubs, who were amazing. Um, we went uh, to different kind of uh, uh, small town kind of organisations. And it really anywhere we could find and just said, look, we want to make the show, you know, do you want to be involved? And we really didn't know what we were going to get. We kept hearing about these sort of mythical collections of footage and kind of chased after them. And, and, but we were, you know, nervous, basically, um, waiting to see what we got. And then, then the footage sort of started to arrive. And then we got kind of more and more and more. And it was like, oh, my God, there's a mountain of footage. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be really interesting. Um, so... Um, so it wasn't, you know, we really had to hold our nerve, actually, because, you know, firstly, we didn't know what footage we were going to get in. And then, obviously, because we are, um, we're telling long-form stories as well as these short forms, we had to find a narrative. And we couldn't find the narrative until we knew, you know, what we were getting. So that was an interesting process. Um, yeah, so eventually, though, the footage sort of started rolling in and... We got lots of packages like this, which was like, you know, treasure. It really was like treasure. It was amazing, and, you'd, you know, you'd know that. And um, people would bring them in often because they, you know, they wanted to bring them in, which was cool. And, and they would tell us the stories, and we'd kind of write them down. And um, it was a massive privilege. And, but, or if they didn't come in, they would send them in with these incredible handwritten notes of, like, of, their, whole, of their kind of life story or of their, you know. So it was amazing. So we, you know, we... Um, we got to immerse ourselves in things that we, in stories that we didn't know about. So it was amazing to work on it. Uh, yeah, so we started getting these in. And then, and, and sometimes like they came in suitcases or like it was all sorts of stuff. And, you know, and, and often people didn't actually know what was on the footage because they had a projector that didn't work or Uncle Bob had left it to them. You know, there was lots of, there were lots of occasions where they either didn't know what was on it, or they hadn't seen it for 20 years, you know. So, um, so quite often they stayed, and we set up a projector room downstairs, and quite often they stayed and they viewed it, and that was um, amazing to sit with them and watch it, you know, again. Um, so, yeah. So, so 
setting up the projector room was a big thing for us. We were really aware that we were dealing with um, treasure, you know, people's material, and we had to, you know, the, we had to really respect, obviously, looking after that, and it was a big responsibility. So we um, partnered with Ian Powell from Reversal, who um, has a Super 16 lab in Auckland, and he was, and he's an expert. He absolutely loves this. His his reason for being is to is to is to keep the kind of love of film going. So that was that was why we we chose him, and we worked really closely with him. And he became our expert. So he would come in. He trained up two of our team, um, so that they could um, look at the footage and and if anything was in any way damaged or smelt bad, then it would go to his lab, and we would sort of deal with it that way. But so um, with the footage that was in good quality, we would um, put it on our projectors that had been serviced and we would film it off the wall. So we filmed it off the wall only for our purposes because we needed to see what we had to sort of make the stories. You know? so, but firstly, like, I'll show you. So this is an example of one story we got in from um, a woman, which I think is a nice example of kind of the poignancy of, of some of the stories. I was the only child in, at school who had divorced parents. Because my parents separated when I was three, and I mainly lived with mum, and saw dad every second weekend, so he made the most of it. He catalogued my life in film. That was dad's way of experiencing my childhood. It was not strange to me to have a camera in my face all of the time. Didn't matter what I was doing, the camera was there. I knew that when I was with Dad, that was all going to be recorded. Well, I was very aware that what made Dad happy was recording everything. So whatever I was doing, I knew to make the best of it so that he would have something nice to look back on. When I got older, I was very annoyed by it. <laughs> Dad used to say, one day these will be very interesting. He was right. <laughs> so it was, you know, it was, um, we had a really big decision. So, so the archive was king for us always in this, um, in this series, but we had a big decision about how much, because we did very long interviews with people like Wendy, sort of four hour interviews to get their stories. And it was a really big decision to decide how much interview, how much, how often to see them. Because we kind of wanted to stay in the footage, you don't really want to leave it. But at the same time, I think, especially with a story like that, it's really nice to see her at the end, because you can, you recognize her, you know, and then you see her now and it's, it's nice. So we, it was a, it was like a judgment call all the way through, like when should we go to interview and when should we just use voice. So, um, so when we were filming the stuff off the wall, we, um, we catalogued absolutely everything that we saw. So we had a really, really detailed, massive, color-coded spreadsheet that we used of, all, of everything that we were seeing. Um, the other really important tool that we used um, was a customer, a, a customer services system called Desk, and we adapted that. Um, because we were getting so much footage in, we needed like a reasonable, we needed eight of us, but we needed the key creatives to be able to, um, to you know, it, it was them, it was, it, was, it was a group of three of us who were making the decision about, you know, what content we were using, but we needed a much bigger team, so we needed um, a system that would allow us to get heaps of information in and communicate with this, the, I think we had about 1,500 different people who all sent us footage. Um, we needed to be able to communicate with all those people, but then we needed a central communication tool so that we could kind of delve in and start seeing some patterns of material that we were getting. So that was um, DISC. This is DISC. This became like really essential to us and um, not, you know, not something that you'd necessarily normally use in television production, but it was, it was great. Um, it meant that we could... Um, assign, this is my one obviously, but we could assign it to different people so I would have the personal contact with those people but if I wanted to assign it to someone else on the team I could assign it to someone else and, and when people emailed us through the system, they, they emailed us all of their personal stories so we got all of that 
through that. So this plus our massive coloured coded spreadsheet is a, is a really um, a really valuable database of a lot of archive uh, in New Zealand. So um, what next? All right. So once we had all this amazing material, the next challenge was to um, work out what we were going to use. Obviously, we only had three one hours, which you know sounds like quite a lot, but with the mountains of footage we had, it was a real challenge. And so we had a lot of coloured post-it notes in the edit suite. Um, and we, like our, what we realised was that um, it was really important to delve in really deep to personal stories, but then come out to tell a, a collective story. So that's kind of the rhythm of what we tried to do. So we just kind of tried to go in specific and then use montage footage to come out again. So um, with the montage footage, this is an example of how we did it. So this is material that we've got from a number of different people, and we used a number of different voices to try and um, talk about something more collectively. The senior girls were manpowered away and had to go to farms or the hospitals and to factories. All of a sudden, they would get a notice, report to wherever, and you're out of here. They just disappeared. One day they were at work, next day, oh, you know, where's Naomi gone? Oh, she was manpower. Gone. During the war, there wasn't the manpower to run the farms, so my mother and her sister ran the farms on their own. They did everything, milked the cows, made the hay, and took the cream to the factory. The land girls did wonderful jobs out on farms that men had always done traditionally. Every bit as good as men. My mum worked in the bomb factory in Christchurch making hand grenades. I know my mother sewed dusters together as part of the war effort. Uh, we had women laying tram tracks during the war and manned the trams and the buses. Well, I think the women, Clippies, enjoyed it. There were hooks on the front of the trams. The poor driver or the conductor had to get out and put the prams up on the hooks. And the ladies had to remember to remove the babies. But if they forgot to secure the blankets and that, if it was a windy day, they might disappear. They loved going out to work and having jobs. Of course, when the war was over and the men came back, they encouraged women back home. Yeah, so that was a more collective story. So yeah, so, so that was our thing. We went in and then we came out. Um, with our footage, once once we had our um, uh, sort of rough cut version, that was when we um, went back to Ian and he did um, frame by frame scanning, so that we only use so we because we obviously could not afford to do frame by frame scanning for absolutely everything. We, so we would only do it once we knew what we were going to use. So that was our process, um, and there were all sorts of challenges in terms of aspect ratios, in terms of. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was a big learning for all of us, um, but it was fascinating and an absolute pleasure to work on it. Um, there were some challenges along the way, for sure. One of them, which is, you know, might seem a little naive, is that we really hadn't thought about the fact that there, um, that there's no audio with most of this early footage. And to, and to start with, that felt like a limitation, but actually, in the end, I think it was quite an amazing freedom because we could look at it in a much more layered way and we could use, um, and, and we could, you know, layer the audio and the visual material in a, in a different way. And, and because we knew we could not make a comprehensive history because we didn't have the footage, it had to be rangy and it had to be personal, it had to be a bit more fluid, it, it kind of worked for us. Um, so um, another really tricky thing was finding ethnically diverse footage, um, particularly in the 50s and the 60s there was very, very little um, and certainly there were lots of storytellers um, but um, cameras were expensive, film was expensive and mostly at that time it seemed to be kind of rich white farmers who, who, who um, owned quite a lot of it. So that was a real challenge. Um, and we just tried to deal with that by making that part of the story. Um, so we, we, did, we did get some, uh, some stories, but not nearly as many as we were hoping. So that, that was kind of an ongoing thing. Um, the other thing that was quite a challenge was that we, we worked with Natonga um, on both of these series at the beginning, but we didn't end up working with them quite as much as we'd hoped. 
Um, and, I, and it was a reasonably challenging experience for both parties, I would say. Um, and I think that's to do with the different time frames, of, you know, a television production time frame um, and a, a not production ready archive house. Um, that was a real challenge and it was, it was a real shame because this, this series is, um, is a celebration of, of film archive and film preservation. So it was, a, you know, we, we really try to sort of make that work together. But because we knew we wanted to go direct to the people in the first instance, we didn't know we couldn't know what footage we'd need from Natong until quite late in our process, and then there wasn't enough time because we were on a, you know, we were, we were on our schedule. So, you know, that w that was a challenge, and I think something that we should discuss further, um, the two parties. So um, I think my time's about up, but yeah, like we, you know, this this series was entirely reliant on the generosity of the contributors, and one of the most satisfying things for us was the amount of feedback we got um, from the contributors um, at the end who who absolutely you know pretty much across the board are delighted that their their films and their stories have had an airing um, and and are all really keen to be involved in more um, we, we made these um, series for prime uh, TV and they're really happy and they're keen for us hopefully to do another one so um, yeah so that was really nice to know that people are really um, willing and keen for this to kind of to get out there. So I'll finish there. I'll just leave you with um, one last little bit. So we probably have time for a couple of questions before we all break out for lunch. So is there any questions? I'll just get the... Uh. Thank you. Um, just wondering, what's the happening with the uh, preservation and the archiving of the films? Are they going yeah. into... Yeah, so we, we obviously are not an archive house. So we, we only copyrighted the material for, for our use for this series. So it's all gone back to them, um, to the owners. But uh, there are definitely a lot of them who want to find solutions about where to put it. A lot of them want to continue to have access to it, and I think that's a little bit of an issue in terms of where, or in terms of where it goes. But it's similar to what you're saying. There's a mass of it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, there, there, there's, there's a, you know, because of the sort of generational thing. There's, there's a whole lot of it that is just sitting there, and a lot of it is deteriorating. So it is quite important that we find a solution. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about the show is that it's kind of irritating, but not irritating. Um, is that you showed a lot of things without context and without times, and you, you want to say there's some things like put it show we saw the meeting, but there are other places you know. It was kind of annoying to me. I want to know where is that place? What time is it? Um, what year? You know, who are those people? And um, Although you had stories, you didn't know whether the people talking were the, the subjects of the images and things. So it's just an interesting thing. I know you're making television, but yeah. you know, I wanted to be a train spotter and say. Yeah. Yeah. No, I. 
Yeah, no, I understand that question, and I um, and it was a really it was uh, quite a big decision making process about how how often to signpost where we are where we were or um, who the people were. Um, sometimes we so sometimes the footage that we got in and the voice that we got went, went together, and sometimes it didn't because sometimes we had a storyteller who was an amazing storyteller but didn't have footage. So um, sometimes it wasn't appropriate to signpost that place, you know. So we just and we, because we could never be comprehensive about the history that we were telling, because there were gaps. There were gaps everywhere because we just got the footage that we got. Yeah, we, you know, our, we we had to be rangy and loose, and that was kind of our decision to, for the, the style of the show would be like that, rather than precise. And so that was what I sort of was was trying to say about going in deep on certain sort of personal levels and then going out and be quite, being quite communal. Yeah. There's lots of questions. Um, I was just wondering, we always hear about how great it is when people contribute and yet their footage gets used and how special that makes them feel. But um, how did you communicate to the people whose footage didn't make the cut? Um, and how did you do that in a way that spared their feelings and enabled them to want to contribute to uh, maybe heritage institutions in the future? Yeah, uh, yeah, that was an important part of our process as well. So um, we made it really clear, as, so we spoke to everyone, obviously, who, who contacted us or indefinitely if they sent us footage. Um, we explained from the, from the beginning that it, um, we were getting an enormous amount of footage in and that it, um, we may not be able to use all the footage. So I, I mean, I think, Probably like anything, it was a it was an ongoing relationship, and I think I, I do think at Greenstone that we take that very seriously, um, and we're aware that there's a much bigger, longer game to play than just the program that we're making. So um, I just think that we were kind of honest and quite upfront about that. And the other thing as well was um, quite often we used only a small part of someone's material, and they and they you know, had a, a, a personal story that they wanted to tell and we couldn't always tell it. But, you know, um, that's, that's always a, a part of, of, <laughs> of making television, really, and I just think you have to handle it carefully and, and respect, um, you know, what people are, what people are giving you and, and just be honest. That's, that's all we could do. That's what we did. Uh, what about your own vision that you took the, um, the audio, the video of the interviews? Yeah, yeah, did you keep? You said you took four hours. Yeah, we've still, yeah, so we've still got that and we really, you know, feel like, um, it's a crying shame that we've used an absolutely tiny amount of it um, and it really should be used in some other way because they are amazing little sort of capsules of um, people's lives and, and really, and as I really range, you know, from the 40s to the 80s. So um, we are trying to think of, you know, and very, very keen to talk to collaborators about what to do with that material because it's, it's um, yeah, it's cool. Well, probably time for one more. Uh, I just wanted to address, it's not really a question, it's a statement, um, two statements, it's beautiful uh, and I guess what I, I, I wanted to address the statement that was made before, you are making television, um, I come from a cultural institution, what I would like to think this can motivate your collecting institutions to do is see the value in this footage because we are the ones that will document the time, the place. We will geolocate. We will identify all the people. We will make that cataloging effort um, as a historical record long into the future. And uh, we, I, I guess we started this journey some years ago. We decided we would champion home movies because we could see the value in it. Um, what I would like to think is that this series um, will motivate your collecting institutions to place the same value on this footage that we have, and therefore that cataloguing effort and so on will be put in place there, because I, I think to echo your statement, you are making television. Um, I can't wait to show this to our stations to try and generate the same sort of interest that you yeah. have shown in this footage. 
We have pitched it to the ABC in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what you know. It's <laughs> Let's talk, Nick. <laughs> uh, so I think that's about time, and I think lunch will be waiting for us. So thank you very much. Thanks.